What in the heck is human-centered and data-driven design, and how can it help your interior design business? Join us for this episode of Designed by Wingnut Social. Hey, and welcome to Designed by Wingnut Social. I'm your host, Darla Jethro Powell, and today we're joined by Sarah Davis and Chrissy Fahan of Pop House Design, and we're going to get into what the hell is data-driven and human-centered design. It sounds pretty highfalutin, but I think you're going to be surprised with how simple, relatable it is, and how it's going to help your bottom line for your interior design business. Without further ado, help me welcome Chrissy and Sarah to the show. Hey there, ladies. Welcome to the podcast. How the hell are you? Good. How are you? I'm great. So we haven't done a twofer in a while where we have two guests at the same time on the show. So uh, what a wealth of information this, this episode is going to be. And I'm really excited to get into our conversation because uh, this is a topic I don't really know a lot about. In the, on, in the green room, we were talking about human-centered and data-driven design. Um, okay, so let, let's just dig in. Who wants to start and tell me what the hell is human centered <laughs> and data driven design? And we'll dig in. Uh, my name is Sarah Davis. Uh, I am the director of strategy for Pop House, which is a commercial interior design firm in Detroit, Michigan. Um, and I'm Chrissy Pihan, uh, creative director at Pop House. I work alongside Sarah and a very talented team of interior designers, environmental graphic designers, and industrial designers. Um, and collectively, we make up a well-rounded space. And if, if you aren't watching the YouTube channel and you're just listening to the audio version of the podcast, um, they are sitting in front of the most gorgeous <laughs> space there. That's one of your most recent designs, right? Mm -hmm. Just really quickly, what is that for the YouTube channel? And then we'll, we will dig in, I promise. So we are in a secret room. Um, you have to uh, enter in through the bookcase. Um, and this is for a marketing team. Uh, they wanted a space that they could have kind of more team cultural meetings. Um, there is a bit of like a wet bar set up behind us that can also be buttoned up behind green panels. So it can also go away. <laughs> are, you really do enter in through a bookcase for yeah, real? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The way you know that somebody's in it is the lights, um, their sconces on the exterior. And when somebody's in the room, the sconces are lit. So um, you're not interrupting a meeting. Oh my gosh, that's like a bat cave situation. That's awesome. So yeah. you guys are going to have to subscribe to us on YouTube or go check that out anyway, at least so you can see that that design. All right, sorry, I got off on a no. tangent because, you know, I am an interior decorator, <laughs> so I have to I had to ask. Okay, so human-centered and data-driven design. Ready and go. Sounds good. So <laughs> for us, we really pride ourselves on doing unconventional strategic and human-centered design. And what that really means is we're using different types of evidence that we're obtaining from our clients. Um, so we spend a lot of time digging in with our clients to really understand how they need to function in space. Uh, so we're collecting information through different types of uh, interviews and observations and surveys and really gathering from them information that we can then marry up with different types of benchmarking, precedent, uh, so external research as well, and together combine that to really work um, as a team to use that to drive our design. Because we believe that spaces can positively impact people, how they interact, how they engage with each other. And so it's really important for us, and we sometimes talk about this art and science, um, the idea that the space needs to obviously be very beautiful and aesthetically um, artful and, and thoughtful, but also this idea that if people can't function in the space, it's not really going to hit the mark. Mm -hmm. So how do we really bring those two halves together and think about the individual's experience in that space? Mm -hmm. It's putting real people and real problems at the forefront of design and pairing that with the brand research um, that we do for that organization. That's what we make a unique space for each of our clients. We're um, looking at things from a very tailored approach and making sure that when you're in your organization, it speaks the same as you're putting out into the world. Okay. So what I'm hearing here is that you guys have put a lot of research, a lot of time and a lot of thought into this concept and this value proposition that, that is a deliverable at the end of the day for your commercial and residential clients. How, how did you come up with this philosophy and strategy and this this framework that informs your design, how long did it take? And you know what I mean? What was the, the, the thought process behind that? I think it's something that continues to even evolve. Um, as we get new projects and we learn the, all of the knowledge that we collect, we continue to evolve it. 
um, we'll take the strat strategy and data and we put it into a narrative framework. Um, and we create design pillars um, and objectives that we then share back with the client and get their buy-in. And that way, at the end of the project, we can look back and reflect and see, did we hit the mark on this project? Did we successfully you know, design a space that met all of the client's needs? Um, mm -hmm. But I definitely think it's something that we're you know, continuously refining. Um, I think Sarah can speak to it a little bit more from, from her, from like the strategy portion as well. Yeah, I'd be curious to hear that because, um, and, you know, in our, my line of work for marketing for, you know, interior designers, we, we always have a strategy and we have the, the positioning and the value proposition and the content pillar. So I'm really curious to hear how that aligns with a, a design philosophy or a design um, strategy. So what, is, what does that look like? For me, I started with Pop House four years ago now, and it's really, as Chrissy mentioned, been something that's organically evolved. So I think as we've gotten more um, momentum, we've started to take strategy and more, um, more and leverage it more into our design process. So for us, as we started, we began to just uh, really start to integrate with the with the clients, really start to understand what are you trying to do in space? What are you trying to achieve? What is this experience that you want? And as you know, over the last four years, we've also encountered the pandemic. Uh, so for us with commercial space, that's really changed things um, along the way as well. And we've had to be able to adapt and evolve. And I think what we found is that because we're looking on evidence-based information, uh, it really sets us up for building design that's not uh, trendy or something that's going to kind of come and go, but it's really something that's going to speak to how team members uh, need to work in space, our workplaces, our niche. Um, and I think that that's one of those things where now, especially in light of the pandemic and people coming back, returning to the office, um, looking at how they need to work and function in space um, and building that as the foundation for our design, which as Chrissy said, that starts to inform our narrative and that starts to become North Star for which by by which we start to design the process. And it's something that we refine, of course, and dial in on as we go. But for us, workplace strategy is at that top of the process with our client work. So if, we're, if we were to put, pick this apart a little bit and pick a project that you had, like say, for example, your, the, the most recent pro, uh, project that would apply to this is the Rock Ventures, which you'll, you'll tell us a little bit about. Um, tell us about that journey and that strategy and how that manifested in the outcome. Um, so Rock Ventures is an amazing client of ours. Um, they have uh, done a lot of really great things for the city of Detroit and continue to. Um, they moved to um, Detroit in 2010 um, and had mm -hmm. not updated their space since then. Um, and they were they were working in conditions that really didn't point them into the future of where their organization was going. Um, so starting in um, summer of 2019, we kicked off uh, design on a new office space from them. So they were going from probably like 20,000 square feet, single floor um, to 50,000 square feet separated between two floors. So the team was doubling in size of square footage, but also they were very jammed into the space that they were currently in. So really needing us to think through like what their adjacencies were, how they all work together, how the different, different teams um, need their space to function for them. Um, but also a team that is super connected mm -hmm. um, and works very closely together is now going to be, you know, spread across two floors. So what does that look right. like for them um, in regards to bringing them together? So um, we started the project in 2019, as I said, um, and then as we were going into showing actual renderings to the client of what the space would look like um, in uh, April 1st of 2020. 2020, um, we had just gone home about like a week before, two weeks before for the pandemic. So um, that was a pivotal point. And I think Sarah can talk to the starting strategy of the project and then also a bit of the strategy of how we kind of quickly pivoted and thought about what the future of work could be. I think one great thing about this client is, is they never put the project on hold. Mm -hmm. um, we just kept going, um, even though you know, a lot of a lot of individuals would have said, we don't know if this is, you know, the right move to invest in our team. And and they never gave up on on that for them. So, yeah, I think it was great. So as we began, we really started. This was an interesting project because, as Chrissy was mentioning, this 
team, Rock Ventures and the Rocket family of companies, represents hundreds of companies in the portfolio. Uh, they are a very dynamic team, a very vibrant team. And so there was a lot of layers to this particular project that we had to consider. And so we right. immediately started digging in with um, how they needed to use space. We started to interview and shadow all of the different sub teams that fell under uh, that Rock Ventures umbrella to really understand the nuances within their, their separate teams. We started to think a lot about circulation. And as Chrissy was mentioning with adjacencies, we started to have to consider how the space was going to be effectively laid out because as she mentioned, it was across two different floors. Um, mm -hmm. We had to make sure that this team had the ability to bring people through the space um, and be able to prov provide exposure um, because they get a lot of tours and a lot of people who are coming in to visit the space. But we also needed to make sure that that was not encroaching upon the productivity and the function of space either, right? Where you have all these people coming through. And of course, this was pre-pandemic. So we were thinking about these different crowds of people walking through the space and really wanting to make sure that people who are working in the space would still be able to do that and do that successfully. So there was a lot of different considerations. And we were thinking about, of course, all the layers in business of culture and community and engagement and productivity. But we also wanted to be thoughtful to how do we socially connect people? How do we bring these layers of wellness into the space as well? So right, right from the get-go, we started to dig in and really think through how all those different layers could then manifest into design decisions that we could make that when you go into the space, feel really great. Is there like a set systems and processes of qu these questions that you just relayed to us when you were considering the the Rock Ventures project that you you walk through and you're like, okay, this question number one is answered. This question number two is answered. You know what I mean? Like a framework that you work through for all of your commercial or residential projects that ask these same questions or is every project different for you? We have, I would say, a framework that we have built out and a structure that we follow. However, I'd say that within those different categories, that's where that customization comes in. So what we, well, mm -hmm. the questions that we're asking specific to the Rock Ventures space, we're currently in the marketing space right now. Those questions that we're asking are different. They're two different teams. This team is very creative. They're going to need some different spatial programming that another team is not going to need. So that's where I think you dial into that particular client, but the overall framework can exist um, and can persist for different projects. So if we were going to look at your framework, like a, a base pillar framework for the, the, the designers in the audience and they're like, wow, this sounds like a really extensive process. This sounds like a very valuable process. What would some of those pillars or points of the framework look like? Is it broken down into like, you know, five main bullet points. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, sure. what does that structure look like without getting, if it's too crazy and you, you know, it should be in the show notes, let me know. But I just, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my mind around that template if, if there is one. Sure. Absolutely. So a lot of it has to do for us based on the scope that we have with the project. As Chrissy mentioned, we have industrial designers, we have environmental graphics, we have interior design. So provided that we're doing a project that's going to hit all three of those, um, those sectors, then um, for our framework, we're initially starting with data collection that is internal based. So again, like I was mentioning, we're going after understanding from the client. They may have recently done surveys, so we may be able to use information that they've already collected internally that can help bolster and supplement our information. We're looking at how we can gather additional layers of observation Sometimes that can be hard. We've had to pivot around that one, especially with the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, some of our projects that were in flight, there weren't people on site for us to be able to observe in the office. So we had to <laughs> figure out a different way to understand how they're using you space. You can blow up dolls and just put them in there. Right? <laughs> how does this work <laughs> for you? <laughs> well, how can we be a fly on the wall? Um, we also have done pilot space. So we have actually set up different types of mock settings for people to utilize uh, and leverage. We learn so much information that way. If we are able to bring people in, sit them down, get feedback from them. We've conducted focus groups where we uh, gather information from people more in mass. And what we find with, uh, just as a tangent, with talking to people and asking for feedback about their space 
they're very willing to give it. We tend to give get so much of a higher response rate with our surveys than you typically get with survey responses because people care a ton about the space that they're sitting in. So we look at a, a slew of information that we can gather internal that will help inform us more about that particular team. We gather information, internal collateral, like their org charts, their uh, cultural documents, their um, any type of mission statements, core values, that type of thing. Wow. Um, so we, we pull that together as a portfolio. Then we mm-hmm. marry that up with external. So I would say there's internal information and collateral that we get, and then we have external discovery. So that would be benchmarking, research, um, any type of uh, precedent that we can get, any type of academic work that we can help uh, bring in. So marrying those two together, and then from there, starting to bring that into our typical design narrative. So how does all of that information start to inform our design principles, our concept for that particular space? And as Chrissy mentioned, then we uh, bring that through and carry that until the very end of the project um, to help us be a bit of a North Star. Is your interior design firm just so busy that you don't have any time to post on your own social media accounts? Are you at a loss with what to post? You have zero strategy? Well, then you need to give us a call, Wingnut Social, or go to wingnutsocial.com and hit that Let's Chat button, and we can take that all off your plate so you can focus on what it is that you do best. And that's not digital marketing or social media, I'm gonna guess, but it's designing for your actual clients. Focus on making that money and let us handle the rest because that's what we do best. Give us a call at 786-206-4331 or wingnutsocial.com. So, so you're, you're, you're human centered. That is one yeah. of your philosophies as a design firm. You're yep. human centered, right? Am I wrong? Am I right? No. I'm right. No, right. you're right. So, right. So that is a, that's a positioning thing for you, mm-hmm. for, for your firm, for mm-hmm. Pop House. Yes. So, um, I, my question is, is how are you marketing that to reach those ideal clients who that is a value for them to invest in? In We, Sarah and I actually work very closely on all of our marketing and social media channels um, and making sure that the information that we're sharing with our clients, we're kind of teasing that into our social. Um, we write stories all the time, which is like our blog post mm-hmm. um, that we um we share a lot of that insights of like what clients can do. Um, and we've also um, recently we're featured in Prop Moto. Um, Sarah and I wrote um, a bit of like a white paper together. Um, and I don't know if you want to tell a little bit about the um, the survey that mm-hmm. you recently are doing and what we're currently working on there. Yeah, I agree. Um, and to just uh, piggyback off of what Chrissy was saying, um, I really think we're reaching clients by using the information that we're gathering and showing how that can be applicable in space, right? It's one thing okay. to read about, uh, you know, acoustics are important or adjacencies are important, but I think for clients, how does that manifest? What does that mean? Why do I need to care about that? Right. And so what we're trying to do uh, through our social media and our writing uh, and conversation is to be able to show the power of that. And when we bring people through these spaces on tours, we're able to not only tell the story of what we thought through in order to get to the end result, but why that's important, right? And people can feel it when you're in space. Mm -hmm. You know how it is when you Mm -hmm. walk into a space and it just feels good and you don't want to leave it. Sometimes you can't pinpoint why that might be, uh, but there's layers there at work. And I think that's been the reaction to our rock venture space is that when you walk into that space, there's something that obviously is working. It's coming mm-hmm. together and coalescing in a really successful way. And it's really because of the layers that we thought mm-hmm. through and integrated um, along the way to make it that way. Um, yeah, I think there's also, this is pivoting away from the question, but like there's an art to that strategy portion and seeing, like being able to read between the lines um, they could tell you that it's, you know, their audio and their computer that's not working when you're interviewing. Um, but really it's the acoustics or the hard materials in a space, mm-hmm. um, or the adjacency of that space to a communal space. Um, so for us, we need to be really perceptive and hear, okay, so maybe it's a little bit more than that original thought of what the issue is and how can we help support that individual? Was there ever a time where Pop House did not have the human centered philosophy or, or mission? Um, I think 
although we now have a, a director of strategy for like the last four years, as Sarah said, um, we've always had that mindset um, of making sure that we're putting the people in the place first um, and that we're designing really thoughtfully for that end user. Um, a beautiful space is one thing, but if you cannot work in it, then what did we do? You know, so um, we've always been office place design. Um, okay. All right. Cool. Yeah, all right. So, cool. so your niche, your niche, niche from the get go. Oh, no. <laughs> I wanted to, what I was trying, I was going to say if there was a difference of before and after, but you guys were mm. smart from the very beginning. <laughs> so let's talk about that niche. So you are niching to corporate offices, offices, residential offices too, I'm assuming. Is that, is that your main niche? Do you do other spaces or is it just where this is it? Where are the office gals? Um, that is our main, although we've done galleries, art galleries in the past. Um, we've done some small retail, um, but mostly we really hone in on commercial. Some interior, a lot of interior designers are all things to all people. And they're a little nervous about niching into a certain space in your, your offices, whether it be corporate or residential or what have you. Um, they're like, oh, I'm going to lose out on this kitchen. I'm going to lose out on this bathroom. And it seems counterintuitive to, to really laser focus in on offices or on a certain thing because they're afraid they're going to leave a lot of money on the table. But in my experiences and, and our clients experience and a lot of interior di designers experience the exact opposite is what happens. So has that been your experience? I think it allows us um, to bring on the proper team members that we need and to grow our business, be able to see what our future goals are. We can we can pivot that around our clients' needs. Um, and it's helped us laser focus in a little bit more. We're not stretched between um, you know, a lot of different types of design. Um, it helps us really thoughtfully like select our clients as well um, and make sure that our culture aligns with, you know, where they see their, their project going. Um, so I think that's been really helpful as well. I feel like there's a lot of diversity within commercial office too. Yeah. And I think that's another really big facet of it that I've learned in the time that I've been with the company is that, you know, when we're designing a, a, a commercial office for a technology team, versus a marketing team, versus a, a team that focuses on sales, versus HR, you know, all of those look different. And so we've had projects where we're dealing with, you know, legal clients or accounting clients. So those look very different. And the needs from those different clients really vary. So I think there's a lot of uh, diversity. There's also, office. yeah, you're completely right, Sarah. There's also like scale of projects. Mm -hmm. um, there are times that we take projects where we're just helping that client's brand be visualized through the space. So as we mentioned earlier, we have environmental graphic designers on our team um, and they help really bring in the core values um, and that brand's like mission and vision throughout the space. And there's times where we have smaller, more startup clients mm -hmm. and, and that's the scope of work that we're doing for them. So um, although we are niched into office place um, or workplace, I think there there's still a lot of modularity there. Sure. I see that your niche um, after the pandemic, especially just exploding, right? Home offices, because even though we are returning to the workplace a lot, I think that a lot of the home working from home is permanent, you know, or at least at the very least a hybrid of that. So what do you see for the future of niching for office design? Do you, do you agree? I would agree with that. I think that there's a lot of um, new differences uh, that have been brought into office. I don't think it's as clear cut as it was before the pandemic. I think that people are working in many different places and there's probably going to be a presence of hybrid that we're going to see continue to persist into the future. So how does that look and how can we set people up that even if they're coming on site part time, how does that how does that look successful? And I think a lot of our clients too are unsure about that right now. And one of the things that we've also found, um, which was related to the last question we just talked about, is even consulting. We're even consulting mm -hmm. with clients to start to say, we're not quite sure what the answer is, and we may need to try some stuff out right now. So clients have actually come to us to start to help figure out that big question and that riddle for their team to say, what, sh what direction should we be going? And let's try something. And let's learn things. Let's learn things that work or don't work and then be able to apply those moving forward. 
I think there's like a high likelihood of your space prior to the pandemic is probably outdated for what your team needs now. If you're looking at just hybrid versus in person, do you have, you know, the proper amount of collaborative space where you can go and be tucked away and you're not interrupting those around you where prior you were all on site together? Um, do you have visibility if you guys are, you know, some people are collaborating in the office and some people are virtual? What is that experience for the person that's virtual? Can they see what you guys are collaborating on? What are, you know, the screen adjacency, monitors, cameras? How is that all set up? And that's something that we're helping the clients work through in that consulting as well. Do you guys see the design of uh, commercial spaces or I guess mostly commercial spaces, not residential so much, returning to pre-pandemic design, layouts, floor plans, and aesthetic? Or do you think that the pandemic, you know, that spacing situation is always going to be here? I feel like we are seeing a shift. And to Chrissy's point that, she was just making. I think that what was received without as much pushback before the pandemic, I think is now not as palatable to people as they're returning to the office. Um, for people who have been at home, they've been able to customize their environment uh, a bit or tweak that. They're returning to the office with new needs and expectations than they had before. And so that requires, I think, companies to rethink. And I don't think it has to be a full-scale renovation. But I do think that companies would be well um, put to be able to think through, okay, should we change some of these adjacencies around? What does that tech integration look like now? Because I know for me, what we had before in the office would not cut it uh, in today's world, right? So what is going to be the experience that I get in the office when I come in that I can't necessarily get at home? And I I don't want to leave this without saying, uh, Chrissy mentioned the survey we just did. Collaboration is super important. Of course, we want the space, and that's the natural thing to talk about, gathering people in a physical space together. It's super important for business, but we can't overlook focus either. There's some people who have had a hard time at home being able to focus and work from home, but people on our last survey had just mentioned that doing individual focus work, 55% said that they would prefer to do that in their organization's office. Um, so thinking about, and to answer your question, the, the variety of settings that you have in a physical office space, I think are so important um, because it's not so vanilla anymore. We're not talking about just workstations and private offices and conference rooms. We're really thinking about interjecting different types of programming into a spatial environment to really support um, everybody's needs moving forward. All right. I love it. Is there anything that I forgot to ask you, lovely ladies, before we get into the fire round that uh, you think the audience needs to hear on this subject? I'm ready for the fire round. Oh, <laughs> fire away. <laughs> You're like, let's just get it over with. <laughs> All right. What would the hashtag on your tombstone be? Let's go quick. Hashtag she tried. <laughs> she tried. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah. Um, hashtag grateful. You're stuck on a deserted island, but you can have your one favorite food forever. What's it going to be, Chrissy? Tofu. Oh. Sarah. Deserted island? I'm going with shave ice. <laughs> <laughs> we were in Hawaii and it was amazing. Shave ice? Shave ice. Can you get some love off of that? It's, it's lit. Yeah, sure. Why not? I picked tofu, but you didn't say I could only have one sauce. So <laughs> tofu just sucks in the sauce. <laughs> <laughs> How I need to gather my, my, my des a deserted island would be like you're stuck all alone on the island. <laughs> Where are answers yeah, weird? Okay. <laughs> Tofu and shaved ice. No, no, no. Is it really shaved ice? Is yeah, it shaved ice? That's yeah. your, oh, okay. Sorry, sorry, Gosh. sorry, sorry. Would you okay, get, uh, would you stay alive on that? Yeah, because it's water. Sure. What the hell? It's you know what? Who wants sugar. to live forever? So, yeah. All right, cool. And last but not least, please recommend a book that has impacted you either personally or professionally. I will say, um, if anyone has not read The Daring Greatly by Brene Brown, I think that it's such a good book. And I think it pushes you. Um, and it really opened up my perspective on stuff, both in the office, but also outside of the office. Um, mine would be Identity Design by David Airy. Um, if you aren't familiar with it, um, there's a lot of great lessons in there for how to position yourself 
um, that maybe you didn't always, you know, learn in art school and things like that. It's really focused on um, contracts and fees and um, knowing your worth in design. So there's there's lots of great tidbits there. Awesome. Great recommendations. Please tell the audience where they can go to find out more about you guys, and we will call it a day. Um, for our website, please check out pophouse.design. Um, and then social media, um, you'll find us at Pophouse Design. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me, ladies. Thank Aww, you. Thank you. This was so much fun. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for joining me, Chrissy and Sarah. If you need any information from this episode, you can head on over to wingnutsocial.com. Check out the show notes, links, book recommendations, all that good stuff are in those show notes. So you don't have to like get in a crash trying to write down notes while you're driving or, you know, get bit by a dog while you're out jogging. (laughs) So wingnutsocial.com again, and you can access our library of all of our episodes for every episode we've done, good, bad, and indifferent, even some with a co-host whose name we shall not speak of. (laughs) Just kidding, but I'm not bitter. Um, That is it for this week. So until next time, remember to get out there, get uncomfortable, and be great. John Wick is my spirit animal, if if I had one. If you're still on the fence on whether or not you should be actively engaged in plosive microphones...